a whole lot of fun. You miss Nigeria conversation. I said, you know, let's pick them up. Uh, let's take them back to Nigeria and let's teach them a different kind of job. Hello and welcome to the show, The Woman on NTA, a one-stop shop of women and what makes the woman thick. One show that showcases variety, spices, different personalities, strength, and if you want to call it witness of a woman, but very importantly, one show that tells us firmly the position of the woman in the society. Every week we make it our job to bring you different personalities representing different fields. And today I have someone who is, uh, for me, a, a sort of uh, activist in different forms, uh, from the child literacy to the adult literacy, but very importantly, she's a culture promoter. She's been on TV several years. I remember her days in the AM Express studio. We'll get to talk all about who my guest today is, but that will be after this time out. Have you ever wondered why some men cannot finish using the towel and just hang it back somewhere in the bathroom? <laughs> why would they have to throw it on the bed? Little things like that, they put up. Have you ever wondered why a grown man with a wife and kids will go to the toilet, the lavatory, to ease himself to do number one, to pee, right? He takes his seat up flips out that thing. The moment he starts peeing, he flushes the toilet. Right? Mm -hmm. the, toilet the toilet does its own bit. The flushing is done before the pee is done. As oh! Like 10 liters of water is wasted. The pee is still there. Oh my goodness! He doesn't put the seat back down. He doesn't reflush. He doesn't wash his hands. He walks away. Ooh. That's why I don't like shaking men, by the way. Mm. There's, there's a particular thing we know many men to be very, very guilty of, and that's throwing their shoes and stockings all over mm. um maybe men are going to be better not throwing it around but they can just there's just something that have those smelly feet and keep it for you in the living room women don't like it mm. all right it's the show i told you is a woman and you're right on time as i will be ushering in my guest for today in the person of uh, an advocate of uh, cultural literacy uh, advocate of child literacy a media personality, the first host at the first Nigerian cultural trade show in 2014. And uh, she's also incidentally a link, I call her that, but she actually was in charge of ensuring that there is the existence of the German Nigerian Business Association. She is also, uh, well, she was also the moderator of uh, the book fair in 2018 at Frankfurt. And uh, she's presently the director of Selena Ventures. And uh, at a point in her life, too, she also uh, championed the sponsor A Child Nigeria. At the moment, she's doing something we call the brothers. I don't want to empty that out because I know it, she's actually into it with a passion. But join me as I welcome Mem Olatori Gabby Williams. Nice to have you on the show. Hello, Liz. Nice to be here. All right. Uh, I know on June 11, you did something. Uh, nice to be here. You did, you did, you did something, uh, a kind of lunch, and I know it's around the brothers. And the uh, brothers is about literature, but that's me talking about it. I need you to educate us. What really is the brothers? Borders, I started Borders in 2015 um, to promote African literature. Um, I wanted to give it more visibility. Um, on the global stage, um, you know, in world bibliodiversity. I wanted to engage with books published on the continent. Um, that's how I started. So I started with reviews, um, book reviews. I also engaged with books about Africa published elsewhere. So I started with book reviews on social media. I wanted to take advantage of the new media. You know, it's free, it's a global platform. And, and I wanted to see how it went, um, build and see how people responded to my work. And they responded very well. And then I started um, interviewing authors. And then I got involved in the book industry itself, you know, with the publishers and eventually sp spread out to the, you know, the wider ecosystem. I've interviewed um, also uh, someone in charge of the biggest, Mar Justin Cox, the biggest marketing and distribution firm for books published on the a African continent. So I now call myself a book industry journalist because I, I 
I seek to promote the, the industry, the best of the industry. There's so much talent, there's so much resourcefulness on the continent um, and, and in the diaspora. And I, I think that, it, although in the diaspora, we, things, are, things are happening for African literature, but um, books published here are still fairly, say, struggling for visibility. Um, yes, so I'm a book industry journalist, an African book industry journalist. You know, um, you are a champion of the African culture being, you know, um, put on the map when it comes to book. So you have been very interested in spreading the African books across the globe. Tell me, for me, I feel for someone who is this passionate about African books, you must have done a lot of reading. What is it that interests you so deeply about the African writers, African stories, that you want to put on the world's map? Well, first of all, I mean, there's a personal dimension here. You know, I was, um, I had a very Eurocentric education. So right up until 2002, interestingly enough, Liz, it was all European literature. I did spe specialize in Francophone literature in university. I did French at University of Bristol in England. And my last year, I was introduced to Émile Césaire, Léopold Senghor, Franz Fanon. But my default literature was European literature. And I was very Eurocentric. And here I am, an African girl, dark-skinned African girl, and I really did not really, I wasn't excited by my own literature, but I wondered why there was something missing. I didn't, I didn't put it together that I don't know enough about the psyche of my own people. I don't know enough about why we respond the way we respond to the, the world around us. And, you know, there was a certain amount of alienation because I seem to know far more about Europeans. <laughs> and um, so, you know, at some stage, you know, the alienation, got, you know, it, it got to me. I, I wanted to find out more about my own people. I wanted to be reconnected with my own people, to be reunited with my own people. And the most obvious way of doing it is reading books written by my own people, not just about my own people, by other people. Mm -hmm. You know, like Europeans writing about, uh, writing about Africans. I wanted to listen, I wanted to read Africans writing about themselves. You know, I wanted to know how we take, why we take, why the culture is the way it is. You know, aspects of the culture I find maybe confining, restrictive. I want to see the rationale behind it, and I wanted to hear from my own people. And so that's how I think the, the, the journey started. And I discovered so much talent for storytelling. Um, I, I discovered, um, you know, the pain I also have inherited, you know, the pain of having been colonized as a people, as a continent, the pain of our people having been enslaved. Um, so I share a common inheritance. So it was interesting to explore the pain of that inheritance through literature as well. And also, you know, our joy, um, how we make the best of things at home in the diaspora. Um, I just wanted to reconnect with my own people, reunite, and I'm, here I am championing African literature and African book industry, and I wouldn't have it any other way. It's better because we have great stories. I remember uh, the days um, growing up, we watched uh, Tales by Moonlight with uh, so much dedication on NTA. And uh, I'm glad the, the program is still retained up until now because it tells us a whole lot about ourselves and um, a lot of proverbs, you know, uh, moral instructions that really come out of these stories. I'm glad you're picking it up. Now, but I notice young people today, you know, we look forward to the time the stories were told, be it on TV or be it under the tree with the elders. Children of today are actually more into their phone and it will amaze you that they're not looking at, you know, books online. What are you doing to promote children reading, especially reading African uh, stories? Liz, I don't have a problem with children consuming content on, on screens. Because, you know, like Okada books, I mean, they're book, they're, they, they sell books on mobile phones, with mobile you know, uh, telephony, and they use all these new technologies to, to, uh, to uh, convey stories, to channel stories. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, as long as they're, they're, they're reading stories. They're engaging with stories. So that's my first, and that's a real priority for me. Um, you know, print, whether they're picking up a book in print, um, whether they're um, going to the theater, uh, whether they're watching, you know, a good film. Storytelling is a very good way of communicating the issues of the human condition. So I just wanted to establish that. Um, yes, I, having said that, yes, you know, my own specialization is, you know, you know, picking up a book in print, and if I have to, in, you know, in my, on my tablet, you know, Kindle form, you know, or, you know, now, because I'm so deeply 
involved in reading books. I read PDF versions as well, you know, of, of books. Um, what am I doing to pro promote um, children reading? We've got this new club called the Border Sustainable Development Goals Book Club. Um, it's a mouthful, as I've said before. So uh, the Borders Book Club is final Borders SDG Book Club. And um, what I've discovered that, is that children actually do enjoy reading. You know, our, our job is to make sure that we supply them with really exciting stories to read that communicate the things we need, we want them to know about. Um, so yes, we started this on the, on the, we launched it on the 17th of June and we've had our first child on the show um, reading for, um, from an anthology, um, beautiful anthology of reimagined African folk tales. And um, his name is a lovely boy from Kenya, Armand Wendwa. And he was just wonderful. He read out two stories with such expressiveness. And um, yes, I think that quite a lot of kids who do want to get on board, they enjoy a good story. Um, I see something that I've been wanting to ask you. Luckily, it's right there at your background. There's International Decade for Af uh, People with African uh, Descent from uh, since 2015 till now. Talk to me. How has been the success story for this project? It's a very good question. A, a very good question. Because I, I, I have certainly not heard it being promoted here. This is where I live now in Lagos. And it was uh, one of my guests, he's a, an African historian, eminent African historian. And I told him about my book club. And he said that, listen, to what is really important is for you to, 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 to engage with the African decade. And I said, African decade. He said, yes, yes. The African decade, you know, for, for, um, for the decade for people of African descent started in 2015. And it goes on to 2024. And of course, I ran with this thing. I went online and I sort of looking through the UN's recognition, you know, and I stumbled. I just found um, one of the key directives, which plug very well into what I'm trying to do, and which is promoting greater knowledge and recognition of and respect for the culture, history, and heritage of people of African descent, including through research and education, and promoting full and accurate inclusion of the history and contribution of Af African people in educational curricula, people of African descent in educational curricula. And I thought, well, this is what I want to ground this club in. I want, um, you know, these books on lists, supplementary readers lists. I want them um, on school curricula globally. And I'm going to use my platform to do just that, to really promote, you know, great African books, either published here or in the, in the diaspora, and bring them to the attention of a global audience. You know, um, a, a lot of times I look at um, the, 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 the books we read in the past. We had uh, uh, J.P. Clark, we had the likes of uh, Wallace Schoenke, uh, we had the likes of uh, Chuna Achebe, uh, we, ha we still have, um, uh, you know, someone like uh, Chimamanda, you know. We've had several writers in Nigeria that made, you know, our Wayek results you know look as good as they, they did when we took uh, um, uh, the school sats I, I, i'm wondering uh, today's children you work you know closely with them do you think we can still replicate such people who are very imaginative creative writers liz we are we are great storytellers there's a crop of new storytellers every day i'm sure on our continent the anthology I've just told you about, there are 12 folk tales, and they were reimagined by 12 Pan-African writers. So writers from all across Africa. Amazing. I sent you um, by WhatsApp the, um, the reading by young Armand Wendwa, 12-year-old in the Kenyan school. Did wonderful readings of these two stories, captivating stories. And I, because of the work I do, I come across writers all the time, writers people never heard of and they're writing sensational stuff. So mm. we have no problems with replacing the Chimamandas or, or succession, not so much replacing them, the succession, or you know, the successors to Chimamanda or the Wallisho or the big establishment characters. We have a whole um, future generation coming of, of, of great writers. Uh, no, it's, it's uh, impressive to see that um, a lot of young Nigerians are beginning to write. But I'm interested to know, 
um, how to, you know, effectively engage the younger ones to read books. I have children, they read books, but I find out they read more of foreign books than African books. How do we get around to ensure that our children, our children's children get to read the African books? Because that's the only way we can, uh, you know, translate our culture and um, our beliefs and um, our values to the younger ones, generations to come. Well, that's one of the things we're tackling with this project, visibility. And the new media really helps, you know, um, social media is a global platform, websites are global, social media particularly, it's so fast, um, it's it just the way it works, the whole connectivity of it. Um, and um, I've been building um, the Borders platform now for five years. And, um, and I just decided, you know, the time has come to use it in a very strategic way and in a way that really brings value to the industry. You know, people from all over the world are tuning into our live sessions, with, whether it's with the editor of the anthology, you know, or whether it's with young Armand Mwendwa from Kenya, lovely schoolboy, 12-year-old, who read two stories. And so, you know, that, that, the book title, the book publishers' um, names, um, the, uh, the authors, the 12 authors, Pan-African authors that, that, that feature in the anthology, their names are out there now. I mean, we, we dedicate, we invest 10 days in each of these campaigns. That's interesting. Now, away from books, I know it's your passion and whatever you do, you do it so passionately. In the past, you have done something we call, you call, and we all queued into it, sponsor a Nigerian child. It's um, a, you know, a branch of your business venture, the Selena Ventures. Talk to me, you did that for 14 years and um, I am told by a little bird that you had an immense joy doing that. Can you share that with us? Um, wow, yes, we started off sponsoring children into schools um, from formal care institutions, mostly orphanages, um, one um, center for people who have you know, uh, disabilities, um, one of the leading centers in the city, we, we sponsored a child um, through secondary school um, from that institution. We um, didn't take on more than 17 children in the end from these institutions because we wanted to reach more children. So how we did that was by converting spaces and orphanages into libraries with all the set texts, you know, school curricula um, and supplementary readers, you know, and we, we reached quite a few. I think altogether we, we, we set up about eight or nine um, orphanage libraries, very well equipped, you know, with, you know, all the modern technologies, photocopiers, scanners, um, computers, really lovely little um, spaces. Um, the only problem, that was a bit demoralizing was maintenance. You know, we wanted local government to get involved and we found that difficult to get them really involved on, a, on, on an ongoing basis. Yeah. We persuaded two to give us subventions to keep them going, to give the orphanages subventions to maintain the spaces. Um, but um, I think when the, that particular administration left, yeah. the subvention stopped. That's usual. Mm -hmm. Yes, in, the, in those two orphanages. That, I, I, I wish yes. I and then, um, you know find a way of uh, ensuring that we get to carry along because a lot of people still uh, look back and say, wow, this uh, particular project puts me on the right path to where I am today. And I must say thank you for that. Maybe with time, you'll get to re uh, you know, rejuvenate that. But speaking about rejuvenation, um, how do you, because I know it's a, a tug of war getting you to really be a part of this show, not that you didn't want to, but your day was jammed back to back, back to back, from one thing to the other. I was almost going like, oh, she's not ever going to make it. But then, even today, we've had to move how many times before we got to this point. And I keep wondering, do you ever rest? You know, and if you don't rest, what is the secret? Because you don't look overworked. You look very rested. How do you spend your leisure time? Thank you so much. And then I love swimming. Before COVID-19 and the lockdown, I would swim. Uh, you know, slowly do 20 lengths in the equally club swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that and I loved, you know, socializing with a few friends, uh, with my few close friends over a nice meal. You know, there's some very nice restaurants now around town. So, you know, we, we have a good time. I, I try to get the balance right. All right. Now, I, I, I would want to know, finally, if, if um, in years to come, what philosophy of yours would you want to be remembered for? How would you want people to remember you? That's an incredible question. It's a very important question. 
um, I really try to um, use my life to um, bring as much value to communities as possible, using my gifts, using my energy, uh, my enthusiasm. Yes, I think so. And um, I love. That's really good. Now, um, you, you put it in a very strict way, but you told us at the beginning how you had to, you know, uh, love your culture enough to come back to, you know, help, you know, build this culture, start from the scratch to begin to help people. I want you to learn a word to the upcoming young ladies of today who are seemingly in a hurry. You know, we want to be at the top, but we don't want to walk the, the road to the top. What is your advice to such people? Hard work is fulfilling. Hard work doing what you love is fulfilling. So identify what you love and give it what you've got. You know, practice, get better at it, um, do whatever you have to do, the courses, the, you know, um, get a mentor. I found that having a mentor really, really helped me. Uh, my own mentor is a Christian mentor and it's, it's been tremendous support. She has been a tremendous support to me over the past years now. I think it's almost a decade now. So, you know, monitoring my progress and talking things through together, um, um, you know, with reference to the Bible. As I said, I'm a Christian, so my own frame of reference is Christianity. Um, I think a mentor is very important, identifying what you love doing. And I think the enthusiasm for what you love will help you get better at it. And, and give it what you've got. Practice, practice, practice. Um, yes, and, and, and love life and love people. Yes, and I, yes. That makes life worth loving, a life that's loveless. When you talk about mentor, I was, um, I was speaking to a young lady and um, what she told me got me amazed that she had a mentor, she looked forward to, you know, meeting this particular person. Incidentally, it was a lady, but um, at the long run, at a very uh, tender age, when she didn't know, this lady raped her. Which brings me back to what we have today. Mm -hmm you know, happening in the society. So because of that, she doesn't go near people at all. Psychologically, she's been, um, you know, you know, raped and uh, raped as well. What do you think we can do, you know, as a society to curb the menace of rape? But there's abuse of power. You're talking about abuse of power and, and power will be abused by some people. And um, she was very, very unfortunate in her mentor. You know, these tragedies happen. Um, how old was the girl? You know, this is all might be a parental guidance problem, a lack of parental guidance, proper protections in place for the girl. How was the mentor enrolled into that role of mentorship? You know, um, this is a tragic story. This is a really tragic story. And I've heard it, you know, I've heard it before. Um, yes, we have to be careful how we recruit people to look after our kids. We have to do, you know, background checks as much as it's possible. I mean, here, data, data is a problem in our environment. How do you really keep track of people's progress through life? You know, how do you really monitor where they come from? We, we have a problem with data gathering. We don't have the mechanisms in place. And um, so it, 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 we have issues, you know, we have, um, we are a vulnerable people because we don't have many of these mechanisms properly in place, but things are changing. And I know that um, um, authorities are taking um, child abuse um, cases far more seriously. There's the Child Protection Unit in, in state governments. There's um, uh, the Child Protection Network, um, which is actually coordinated by a man I, I admire tremendously and I know quite well, um, you know, Dr. Gabriel Oyediji. And I spoke to him actually recently about um, this escalation in child abuse, um, you know, sexual defilement cases. And, you know, he gave me the sort of step by step procedures of how these things are um, addressed. And I know that the child is immediately taken out of that situation and put under the care and protection of an orphanage um, while the, the authorities investigate. Let's uh, keep uh, lending our voices and uh, beyond just the voices, lending our action. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Liz. All right, I keep admiring uh, the gray hair, which I think, I don't know, it's patterned in such a way. There's a way your own is is specially designed, customized for you. But it looks lovely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Liz. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. The show uh -huh. has been on with uh, Mem Olatoy Gabby Williams. And uh, we've had an uh, immense joy having this conversation. We've had, don't forget, it is the woman. And next week, 
we will ensure that you have another pack of fun with another very vibrant personality. But while you're waiting to do that, do your own bit. Don't forget, the girl child is the woman of tomorrow and that is the future of every nation because the, a home is only a home when there is a woman. Otherwise, it remains an empty house. I bet you. Train a woman and you train a nation. My name is Elizabeth. We'll be with you again next week. Until then. Bye.